will kick off today's seminar with a short welcome address by Mr. Edwin Glasgow, Queen's Council and Chairman of the SIMC, who is a very well-known figure to many here. And we are very delighted to have Edwin serve as the Chairman of the SIMC Board. Edwin was, together with Mr. George Lin, Senior Counsel, appointed Co-Chair of the International Commercial Mediation Working Group by the Chief Justice and the Minister of Law last year. It was because of the Working Group's recommendations that the Singapore International Mediation Institute was launched earlier this afternoon and SIMC will be launched later this evening. Edwin is an accomplished barrister, an approachable arbitrator, uh, no. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass him. <laughs> and of course, Evan is also a very uh, outstanding mediator, and no one is more qualified to speak to us today as well as to welcome everyone. Evan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eunice. Despite all that, I'm well aware of the fact that the vast majority of you are saying, what on earth is he doing there? And incidentally, what on earth is he doing on the working party in the first place? Neither of those questions can I answer, but I, I am uh, able to make you very, very welcome. It's, it's so nice to see so many friends and some, some fresh faces as well. Uh, because I am a foreigner, I hope that I can be forgiven for breaking with protocol without causing offence. Uh, I've attended a lot of um, uh, conferences in Singapore, and I, I am actually well aware of the way the thing ought to be done properly, and I apologize for the fact that we don't do it properly. I'm afraid we've broken with protocol, particularly in the introduction phase. I have found that in Singaporean conferences, the introduction of speakers is rather like a cross between a, 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 a society wedding and children playing past the parcel. Uh, we all know that the society wedding has a hugely uniformed, large man who knows absolutely nobody, but who wears a uniform rather like that splendid outfit that Idi Amin used to wear, you know, the, the field marshals kept the lot scrambled egg on, and he has a voice to match, and he booms out unpronounceably the names of people who he has never met and whose names he can't pronounce, just at the moment when the first person but that is saying goodbye to the bride's mother, who is bewilderedly shaking his hand, wondering who he was, and wondering whether she is at the right wedding. That's the way we organize our <laughs> wedding, certainly in England. And the equivalent of the pass the parcel, which I think is small children frantically ripping paper off parcels, passing it on to the next child, trying to make absolutely sure that they are not the one who gets left with the embarrassment of being presented with the equivalent of having to introduce somebody, which is a, a small plastic toy, which costs considerably less than the hundreds of meters of expensive wrapping paper about them to then strewn on the floor. But I do know that in Singapore, the tradition is that you have the head of the hotel introduces the head of the conference center, who introduces the leader of the conference, who introduces the person who is about to introduce the people who are about to speak. <laughs> At that stage, everybody is totally lost. But the number of people you've had coming and going uh, is impressive uh, for the hotel, for the conference organizers, but least of all for the person who's actually going to make the speech. We thought we'd do away with about three layers of protocol, and I hope I can do that without causing massive offense, leading in mitigation that I am, of course, a foreigner who doesn't understand enough about local etiquette, and you'll forgive me, provided I buy you a drink later. It does, however, give me the opportunity of more personally thanking Eunice. And I, I, I do want to thank Eunice and, and her team and a number of other people, and I'm sorry that I start the day doing that rather than concluding it, because there are even more important people joining us uh, this evening, and it will become less and less intimate. Uh, and I want to say it while it's all fresh in my mind. Institutions like uh, SIMC, like uh, uh, Maxwell Chambers, like the Singapore International Arbitration Center, However brilliantly conceived they are, and of course, as we all know, the SIMC is brilliantly conceived because of the working party that set it up. It doesn't matter how brilliantly conceived. It, they can only be as good as, like mediations, the people who operate them, just as mediations. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. They are as good or as bad as the mediator who does the job. So are institutions like the three that I've mentioned. We are hugely happy and fortunate. Not only could today not have taken place, but the last 18 months of frantic preparation for today could not have taken place without the three remarkable ladies. Sad in this sexist world, there are always women who do well, and we have to trail behind them, pretending that we aren't jealous. But our chief executive, of course, uh, Shafui Lim, who is outstanding, as we know, manages to run SIAC as well as running SINC at the same time. And that's an interesting twinning of arbitration and mediation, which we think is incredibly important. 
Eunice and Francoise de Waal, and the three of them worked together. Without them, we could have done nothing, and we certainly couldn't have managed today without the extent to which, with the huge goodwill, we have uh, disrupted the, the, the staff of, of Maxwell Chambers, who, as always, have made us so welcome. We thought it was much more appropriate that we should come here rather than go to some grand hotel. It will be uncomfortable. There will be lots of people crushing in at the end, but we are home showing you what we do and where we do it, and we think that's more important. We couldn't, however, have done it without Ginian and Riz and her team from, the, from, from, from Maxwell Chambers, or indeed from the support of our loyal friends and neighbours who in any other jurisdiction would have presented our presence, mm -hmm. but they have welcomed us warmly, the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. So that's the background. What we wanted to do was to give you, and please don't be too afraid, it's, it won't be a, a, a serious academic lecture. We wanted to show you a little bit about mediation, and we thought that, so I'll say more about the mediation panel that we have later in the day. I'm, I'm just going to talk about two members of the panel, and to get the serious bit over first, John Starica and, and Jeff Sharp are, without any question of doubt, two of the finest mediators in the world. They have international reputations second to none. Uh, they better have, otherwise they wouldn't be on the SIMC panel, and that's no joke. There is nobody on the SIMC panel who is not of international standing and recognition as a mediator. They are quite special for lots of reasons that you're about to see. One of the reasons why they're no special is that what we did, being an international organization, we spread the map on the wall and we took the two jurisdictions most far apart from one another, uh, Scotland at the top left-hand corner and New Zealand at the bottom right, and saw whether we could do it. Now, any organization that can get a Scotsman and a, a Kiwi in the same room without bloodshed is doing quite well. It will say quite a lot for me to believe me. Uh, they do not have a history of long and happy international relations. The Scots, of course, being Scotland, uh, the many, many hundreds of years couldn't stand the climate or the company. So they've been going abroad, even some of them to England, to pinch all the best jobs. Those who couldn't find good jobs in England went off to uh, Australia, found there were too many English criminals that were really got there. <laughs> <laughs> so they took the next boat on and went on, where at least it wasn't a penal colony, and they were made welcome, of course, by the natives who were residing there in New Zealand and set up farming. And there are very few uh, residents of, of, of New Zealand, of course, who are not called the Gregor or the Parish or something who sent their Christmas cards home to Scotland. And they, they got on there perfectly happily and forgot all their, their, their Scottish roots until, of course, they started playing rugby. And they fancied themselves no end. Uh, the uh, New Zealanders aren't any good at playing rugby, but they do have the advantage of Kiwi, of, 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 of Samoa, and uh, of various other small islands, Fiji, fairly close by. So they can import a quality of player that makes the rest of us. <laughs> And what they do then is during their summer season when they're not beating each other up over here or getting involved in fights in bars, is they come and do exactly the same thing in either Glasgow, Edinburgh, or London, and they play for the clubs. That was all a frankly good idea until Dolly Weir, who played against the great Tian uh, to Wagamala, uh, thought it would be a very good idea to persuade Tugamala to play for Scotland. And there was a, they put him in a kilt and he looked at the part. There were one or two people who were slightly quizzical. And he did, in fact, play for a number of clubs and did have a trial outing for the Scotland second team, at which point they wondered whether they could stretch the rugby union rules far enough to include him in the Scotland team. He appeared as an interview in front of the board, and this is true. He was asked whether or not he had any Scottish blood in his family, and he replied bravely, yes, I have it on good authority that my grandfather ate a Scottish missionary. <laughs> They weren't quite sure that that was the kind of qualification that they had in mind. So as I say, any organization that can get a Scot and a Kiwi together without, uh, I hope without cannibalism, but short of bloodshed, these two can do it. You're in for a hugely entertaining afternoon. I am grateful to you all for coming. Some of you have traveled enormous distances. I'll be talking about later. No one's traveled further or with more goodwill than these two. I, for one, look forward enormously to being entertained by them. Jeff and John. It's that time in the mediation, folks, when I'd like to say a few words. Uh, first of all, I'll put on my microphone so you can hear what I to say. Thank you all for coming here for this mediation today. I realize this is a difficult matter for you all, particularly with the feedback from the microphone. That off. And I'll just I'll just be into this one, folks. Can you all hear me at the back of the room? 
Yeah. So thank you for all, all for coming to this mediation, and thank you for the honour which you've done to Jeff Sharp and I in appointing us as your co-mediators. It's a real privilege to be here in this room, working with such a large and diverse group of parties, given the conflict that you have got. Uh, and clearly, as I as I make these um, few remarks, which are carefully scripted and somewhat improvised. The, the, the tension in the room really has been made clear to us in the words of Edmund Glasgow. Clearly, there's, Ed, Edmund is angry <laughs> and feels the need to vent his frustrations about the situation in which he finds himself as an Englishman in this part of the world. <laughs> and what we hope is that in this environment, in this mediation environment, Jeff and I, as your co mediators, is that we can help Edmund and others who've got difficulties and challenges with the matter which presents itself. So, in saying thank you for inviting us to be here as your co-mediators, can I say a little bit about the day and about the role that we are going to play? Our role as mediators today is not to make decisions for you or to tell you what to do, but to work with you as hard as we can to help you work through some of the difficult challenges that you face perhaps to glean a better understanding and a greater appreciation of different perspectives and different points of view in the mediation process. So we're not here to judge, we're not here to judge you, we're not here to judge this dispute. What I frequently say to groups, people like this, as we convene after our breakfast meeting, is that mediation offers maybe three particular contexts. One is opportunity, one is choice, and one is responsibility. These are three words that you'll find that we will refer to as this mediation unfolds in the course of today. Opportunity for you all to work through the difficulties that you're presented with, to learn a little bit from each other and from us about the way in which this process might work. And choices too, choices to make about how you go forward, and particularly choices at the end of the day about whether you take any of this on board, whether you come to a conclusion based upon the discussions that we've had, and finally, responsibility. Responsibility ultimately in mediation, perhaps different from other processes, is to yourselves, to those whom you represent, to those to whom you're responsible. Responsibility is to make decisions if you wish to do so. Now I appreciate that um, time is relatively short today. Jeff and I are here for the whole day. Uh, we've spoken to many of you in advance, and we know that you're free until the early evening at least, and perhaps later if necessary. We're not in favour of going on until 1 o'clock in the morning, but if we need to, we're happy to do so. Our commitment to you is, 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 is to give you everything we can in the course of the day to help to make this work. Sometimes it might feel like waiting through treacle. Other times it may be, as somebody said to me recently, it may feel like stirring concrete with your eyelashes. What an extraordinary phrase that is. But if it feels like that, bear with us, because we're here to work with you to help you to work this through. Now, I know that Jeff and I, according to Edwin at least, come with some authority, some experience, and I suppose some credibility. And that's important because we're here to, to guide, uh, to lend you assistance to the sounding boards, and indeed to ask some tough questions, if that's what's required. Every now and again, I may put on my metaphorical wig and pretend to be Mr. Justice not very clever or Lord not very bright and maybe suggest to you in your rooms privately uh, some of the issues that you may want to think about as you think about the risk that you face. On the other hand, we don't come here with the answers. There's no right or wrong or one way of doing things and so we make suggestions to you today about how to take this mediation forward. We do so knowing that you may have different points of view. So please do ask questions, make comments, challenge us if you wish, because as mediators, that's our role. We're not here to prescribe. We're here to work with you. After all, it is your process, and you pay us to be here. But well, we think you pay us. We pay us, you pay us to be here to help you to, to solve this out. The paradox about this today is that you need to work together. So um, on this side of the dispute, you need to, for it to work for you, it has to work for those on the other side of the dispute. Well, and of course, paradoxically for you, for you to get the outcome that you're looking for, it has to work for these folk as well. That's the paradox of the gain-gain, if you like, or the gain-gain approach to mediation, which we will work with today. And it's not really about how little you give or how much you get. It's what will happen if you don't. If you don't participate, if you don't take part, if you don't agree to 
to work with each other in order to gain something mutually beneficial from the day. That's the benchmark, folks. Again, it's which to test whatever outcomes may bear fruit in this mediation. I want to suggest also listening. Um, it may be that because of the situation in which you've got yourselves, it's difficult for you to receive new information. So what I'm going to do is ask to listen out for things which may be surprising or even challenging, testing the position that you may have taken as you come into this particular dispute. Um, I'd say that with a particular interest in your culture. One of the things that we have to be very careful about here as we come in from our different cultures from different parts of the world is that we don't make assumptions about your particular cultural norms and approaches. Let me say this, just in coming to a mediation in a different a country, I often come a day early so that I can learn a little bit about the, the country and its, uh, its cultures and its norms and, and so forth. And yesterday I went to the Mali Cultural Heritage Centre uh, near Arab Street. I did that particularly because, as it happens, my father was born in Negri Simbalan, which is just 100 or 200 miles, as I understand it, up to the Mali Peninsula. I've never been to his birthplace back in 1923. Uh, but the Mali Cultural Heritage Museum gave, or center gave me something of a feel for the Mali culture. And let me just read from a photograph uh, which I took as I was there yesterday. The two phrases which struck me as I looked at the um, exhibition that was on there. One was Buddy Bikara, and I'm, I hope I get the pronunciation correct. And the other is Buddy, that's, that's the wrong one, just bear with me a second. Buddy Bikara, that's it, I found it, that's the trouble with looking at these things on your phone, it, it's Buddy Bahasa. And Buddy Bahasa refers to manners. And what I want to do is to build on that idea of manners, in, in which I know is very important in this culture, and to remind you of the need to show respect to each other, to be dignified. It's so easy, isn't it, in a dispute to, um, assume that the other is out to get you, to regard what they say as being malicious or in some way uh, designed to undermine you. But if we can separate the people from the problem, we can follow the Buddy Bahasa idea of manners and respect. And the other, and I just hope it will come from my last slide here, yes, it's Buddy Bikara. And that, it comes from the original Sanskrit meaning, which is wisdom and meeting to discuss in order to find a resolution. And again, just taking that short and perhaps misapplying the Mali culture and language, this is all about meeting together and having discussions in order to reach a resolution. So I'm somewhat confident, along with you, Jeff, I hope that the culture in which we find ourselves is one in which we can find mutual satisfaction. We often talk in Scotland about the idea of Jock Tamson's Bairns. Jock Tamson's Bairns is our idea that, in fact, we have much more in common than we have which separates us. We're all children, after all of the same God, with a small g, or the same source, or every man, whatever it might be. And I'm comforted also in having read Joel Lee's Asian book on an Asian perspective of mediation, that much of your cultural norms are very similar to those which Jeff and I have. But let me, in, ladies and gentlemen, in coming to the end of this particular uh, introduction to the mediation we're about to engage in, just say one or two other things. Do remember, this is hard, I know, that there are several sides to most stories. In reality, you have your perspective, and they have their perspective. And even if you don't agree with what the others think or say, it might be helpful to accept that they see things from their point of view. You might have missed something obvious. You might even have to use one of the, 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 the modern psychological terms, reactively devalued what your counterpart have said. In other words, because it is your counterpart or your opponent, you devalue what they say. One of our jobs is to help you things differently and to reframe where necessary. I make only one assumption today, and that is that we're all here trying to do our best. We'll do our best, and I assume, and I ask you to assume about others, that you will do your best also. So that's really what I wanted to say at this stage, and forgive me for having gone on at some length. I find at this stage in mediation, after we've all met and mingled for breakfast, that it's useful just to have these few words and, and reflect on what they mean to us. We're going to break shortly and go off to private rooms because very often it's easier for you to speak frankly and directly to us 
uh, in the private rooms rather than speaking to each other at this stage in a plenary session. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I'm going to have a, a chat, if I may, with the principals. So could I ask all of you in the room, please, to leave, apart from three principals, and we're going to have a short chat here. <coughs> and there's one further thing I should say. It's about confidentiality. Nothing we say in this mediation is confidential. You can tell everybody in the world everything that you hear, and it would just fine, because it will help us to understand this better. John, well, well done. Um, before we talk about what's going to happen over the next hour, just tell me what we heard. Is that was that an opening that you would do? Yeah. In in a real mediation, I mean, I heard a, I heard breakfast. <laughs> uh, I heard a paradox. Asking people at nine thirty in the morning to work together that doesn't happen in my world. Um, tell us about what. Yeah. Well, what what, what this was about is. Um, this is an illustration. I mean, we, we talked about how to start off this event today, folks. And we could have done the usual kind of hello, welcome, thank you very much indeed. But that was a, that was a double uh, shift, if you like. One was a genuine introduction to what we're hoping to do today. But it's also a, a heavily um, manufactured version of what I do in most mediations. In most mediations in which I am privileged to be instructed, I will have short meetings privately with the parties in their own rooms. And then we will all meet together uh, for breakfast, or it's equivalent, pastries, orange juice, coffee, and tea. And the idea of this is it allows the, all the players to get to know each other, and I encourage them to shake hands, to meet, to chat, even those who are protagonists who may not have got on particularly well in the past. And, and nothing else happens apart from meeting and chatting over a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and a, and a croissant. And then I do this. And I stand up, and in a much less happy than formerly way than, than this, I, I chat about the mediation, about the mediation day, what's going to happen, and I give them some of the stuff that we often talk about when we're teaching and training in mediation, but we hardly ever use in mediation, such as the cognitive traps, although I try to find language to make it work. Um, and what I do is try to set a, a, a common tone. Um, and then the last piece was, well, again, I, I try to do as often as I can, and that is to meet the principles on their own, Jeff, uh, <laughs> privately before we, we go on. So that, that's a kind of illustration of a, of a particular approach. And you'd meet with the principals that early in the process? Yeah, well, we'll meet them in the room with their yeah. meetings. Yeah. Uh, and then, and I mean, this will all have been cleared with the lawyers beforehand. Right. Right. Um, and we discuss it again, you know, in the private room before, before we have our breakfast. Um, but I, it is, after all, the principal's problem. Mm. It's their issue for their day. And what I think I'm beginning to discover is that the more that we return the decision-making process to the principles, the better it can be, and the more they will be involved from the get-go. So it's a, it's a little chat about why we're here. It doesn't always work, it doesn't always happen. Yeah. Um, but the context, anyway, is, is, is a set, set to me. And, and, and look, we'll come back to that. Should we just talk, talk a bit about what we want to do over the next 45 minutes? Yep. Um, yep. Folks, nice to see you all. Lovely to see some familiar faces uh, in, in the audience. What John and I have wanted to do today is set this up as a bit of a far side chat. So we're going to be sitting down, standing up, but don't, don't take offence if we don't stand up when we talk. Um, we, I mean, you've, you've got a perfect storm. You've got a New Zealand accent and a Scottish accent, so it'll take you about another 10 minutes before you get your ear in. So hopefully we'll, we'll get the good information then. But what we want to do is develop a conversation with you around the theme of sticking with it. And John and I discussed this at a distance, uh, what we should talk about. And um, both of us, uh, from bitter experience, have uh, uh, you know, had mediation suffer when clients or lawyers uh, don't stick with the process. And so our theme today is going to be sticking with it. And that may resonate with some of you. I know there are some wonderful mediators in the audience. We've got, we've got go-to mediators from Hong Kong, London, Melbourne, Brisbane, or Moscow, all around the world. So I, I'm hoping that they will chime in as well as everybody else. But, but the theme will be sticking with it. We've divided it up into four or five topics. Uh, the first one is preparation. So we come back before the mediation. 
preparation to maximize the prospect that they want to be at LDR. The second one is cooperation amongst advisors and experts. Um, that's a particular favorite of mine. I think that that is a hugely important aspect of a successful mediation. We'll talk about that, what happens, how we can, how we can make that better. Third topic is making the best use of the opening two hours. And John, you're gonna, you're gonna anchor that. Yep. Um, and again, I think that golden hour or two of the mediation is so important when you set the tone. Mediator has a lot to do with that, but so do counsel. Uh, or lawyers. I'm going to use counsel and lawyers interchangeably. interchangeably. I know that in your jurisdiction is probably means barristers, doesn't it? Well, counsel means barristers and right. solicitors, so we, we have the generic term. Let's try and lawyers. use lawyers, yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah. making the best use of the opening two hours. Uh, and then the fourth topic, if we have time, is perseverance and patience. You know, the mediator needs to be front and center. I always say the mediator needs to turn the lights out. Uh, you know, it needs to be the first person there and the last person to leave. Uh, and we've got some differences Absolutely. about that. Yep. And then the last topic is uh, persistence. Even when the mediation has not got to yes, what can lawyers and what can mediators do to bring that back to a successful conclusion? Great. So those are the four or five topics. Let's see what's happened to our slide. No. Nope. In the transmission from Apple to PC, Apparently, the fluids have got out of your sink. Ah, okay. And I was completely put off by that. And it's interesting how easily a small thing can unsettle you yes. in a situation like this and in a mediation. Yes. You know, so it's interesting, just small things make a difference. Anyway, yeah. sorry, Jay. So, look, I think preparation. <coughs> preparation, I mean, if you can. Let me, let me, let me just to kick off the point. Yep. I mean, I, I, I found this quotation by Alexander Graham Bell in a slideshow which I put together a while back. Before anything else, preparation is key to success. It seemed to me that we need something more culturally relevant, so I found this this morning. From Confucius, success depends upon previous preparation, and without such preparation, there is sure to be failure. And I, I'm a huge believer in the excellence of preparation. I aspire to be, even if I don't achieve this, a world-class performer in what I do. I aspire for others who are involved in mediation that they be world-class performers. Uh, privilege in recent years to work a lot with Olympic athletes, and coaches, and governing bodies, particularly in the lead up to the uh, 2012 London Olympics. And what struck me was the extra length, and sometimes very short length, to which they went in order to achieve success. Micromillimeters, microseconds, make the difference for them between gold and fourth place. So at the margins, everything matters. Now the same should apply, it seems to me, to what we do as mediators, but also as representatives of, of clients, and indeed in helping our clients to be all they can be. So I make a great play of preparation and feel very uncomfortable if people come to mediation underprepared or even unprepared, because I don't think they'll have a world-class performance, nor will they achieve a world-class outcome. So here are some of the thoughts that I'm going to work through in conversation with Jeff, and we'll look forward to other conversations thinking about what happens in the very first contact and, and thereafter, the nature and content of communications and aspects of coaching that come into play even at this early stage, how we go about the uh, generation and assimilation distribution of, of material in, in written form. So I've got there joint individual summaries. Now Jeff and I have had a discussion about what we call these uh, bits of paper. A lot of folk will refer to the contextualization of a party's case as a position paper. I will not ever refer to a piece of paper like that as a position paper because that simply for me reinforces the notion of positions. Whereas our approach should be one based on interests. But we can have a discussion about that. Yes, and, and I think that's dancing on the head of a pin really. I mean, everyone in my world calls it position papers and nothing's nothing's taken from it. And you wonder why you get no mediation there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll talk about risk analyses and, and other other more, um, I suppose, sophisticated approaches which advisors can, can take to preparation, obviously location, venue. I want to come back to culture and the importance of that. Process design, which is itself interesting, because we kind of assume that it's a one size fits all, the one day or two day classic mediation. In my experience, we can we can depart from that readily, easily, and flexibly if required. And of course, all of this 
builds up to how much we get to know about before we even start. And I'll finish off with what I call a preparation question here. So Jeff, let me ask you first of all, how do you get started with your first call from the, 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 the lawyer, presumably, and they say, hi Jeff, uh, I've got this mediation, what happens? Normally the first contact is from the lawyer, as you say, and it'll be one lawyer um, uh, you know, of, of a, of a two-party dispute or, or more, and it's normally about dates. So uh, they normally like to, lawyers normally like to establish availability. Often it's, are you around in November, as opposed to, can you do it on the 17th? And that's really the first contact. They will then go away, shore up those dates with all those involved, and come back. And meanwhile, I've just sort of penciled it in my diary. So it's a very, very, um, uh, you know, a, a process. Yeah. What's, what's the first substantive engagement that you have with them about, about the substance of the mediation? Well, look, I'm ashamed to say that I no longer uh, convene uh, pre-mediation telephone conferences uh, just just because of the logistics. Uh, so I will, I will. The first substantive uh, contact is really after I've got the papers, and then I'll ring, and it's normally two or three days before the mediation, and I'll ring the lawyers and just chat through the, the various bits and bobs. Normally after I've got the case summaries or position papers, and I'll be looking in that contact for what I call mediator intel. So I'm looking for, you know, I know what the case is about, don't bother telling me the third paragraph of the statement of claim. What I'm looking for is the good stuff. Uh, and that helps me as a, as a mediator. If I don't get it in that call, I'll normally get it in my private meetings on the day of the mediation. Can I then talk a little bit about, about my approach? Can you all hear at the back of the room all right, even though our microphones are not switched on? All right, Danny, can you hear okay? All right. I mean, I, I'm interested you said that you're ashamed to say that you no longer know. I want to talk a little bit about that. My approach would be, as soon as the date is fixed, following a similar approach to, to yours, to arrange through my office a conference call at least to a meeting. Now, geographically, that can sometimes be easier for me where I am in a small geographical area, but very often not. And I would, I think always, but then once you know, I think universally, but nearly always, have a telephone conference call as soon as I can with the lawyers, at least. Well, I mean, I'd be interested yeah, in... Yeah, so we can it, open that up? Yes, because I must say, <coughs> Uh, it suited me to to move off the default position of having a telephone conference, but the lawyers were certainly resisting that because it became another negotiation over another date, and it was so hard to organise. But I'd be very interested to hear um, others. Um, Ian Hanger from from Brisbane. One um, well, that frequently doesn't happen, and I have to say, it's probably to refer to. I think having a I think having a an intake pre-mediation conference it is important, yes. and not with the lawyers. Um, I like, doesn't always happen, to meet the clients three or four days before a mediation because I don't believe most people on the day of the mediation in the first hour are listening. Yes. They're too nervous, they're too, too, too you know, stressed. If I can have a cup of tea with them three or four days beforehand, I would like to, and I get to know them, and I get to actually think about the case in the shower that night and say, well, so-and-so is going to be very difficult, you know, and you sort of work out an approach because you know the client. And, and Ian, you know, they're from Perth, how do you handle that? From They're flying in from Perth, I mean, well, all those that logistical... Case, in that case, it can't happen. No. Um, oh, I mean, my preference then is to see them at 8 o'clock in the morning and have a chat with them. Yeah. But I just think... It's for their benefit to see them some days before yep. so they can go away and think about what you've said. Yep. And you can think about how to handle those people. Some people, and you know, you have to think about the same thing with lawyers as well. Some are very difficult, and some are very easy. Yep. I mean, okay. if, there, if there are users in the room, it would be very interesting to hear from, from corporates or individuals who've used mediation whether they appreciate, you know, some real contact with the mediator prior to the mediation. Very hard to arrange, but, yeah. Well, John. 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 <laughs> oh, God. As a user, I think, for us, it's actually quite useful to actually talk to the mediator face-to-face -face at the earliest possible uh, opportunity. 
because um, whilst lawyers are quite useful when you get to mediation, they still have that advocate position and they're trying to sell that as their point of view. Whereas, I'll be honest, users generally, especially in my area, are looking at a more commercial outcome. And you might, as a mediator, you will generally get a better feel for what the actual positions are from the individuals concerned and the concerns they have than you would do necessarily for the lawyers. I think you, you'll, you'll normally find that. So certainly from the user's perspective, it's quite good to talk to the mediator as early as possible. And I think what comes out of all this, thanks John, thanks Ian, is that there is a diverse way of doing this. There's no one size fits all. But what is really important, I think we all think where it's at all possible, is to engage as early as possible. So whether it's with only the lawyers in a telephone call, either individually or in a conference call format, and it could be either or both, or as Ian does, meeting with the parties. I mean, I've had one recently where I met with the two principals the evening before the mediation. So they had come in from wherever they were coming in from. I cleared it with the lawyers. I had invited the two of them for dinner, but they didn't want to be in the same room at the same time for understandable reasons. So I had a drink with each of them for an hour sequentially in the day prior to the evening prior to the mediation. It made a huge difference the way in which the mediation started off the following morning, and that's another spin <coughs> on the theme. Uh, notice Jane and Arthur, I mean, you, you were shaking your head, I suspect, because some of that is just simply physically and logistically impossible, but that's an assumption I'm making. Do you want to add to that before I round off? Yeah. I was actually telling your wife, John, that in international mediation, which, which is what today in this centre is about, it is impractical to think that you can actually speak to the parties the day before. They're normally on a flight, um, but yeah. you, to get them together would be very difficult. To get to speak to them on the telephone a day or two before, before they got on the flight? I, no, I don't challenge that. It's the actual meeting in person. It's, physical it's, it's just yeah. not possible. Yeah. Um, and there may well, well not be much interest in doing it as well on the part of someone. If you're looking at um, individuals or corporates that don't mediate very often. That's one thing. If you're looking at hardened insurers, there may be some in the room who do this reluctantly on a regular basis. Many of them, many of them will not be very interested. It's hard enough to get them to come to the mediation these days. To try and talk to them in advance is very hard. Okay, well, what I would want to do is to challenge some of the norms, but have this, we've got Mike and Liz with the hands up. So let's go with Liz first, because the microphone's nearest to you, and then we'll come to Mike. Um, it's with Birch, yeah. Just going to say, um, there's another problem with um, international commercial mediations, which is that very often we're dealing with a team of people. And uh, uh, there isn't just one player amongst those that's the important person to speak to. Um, and that's another factor which makes it difficult. Um, but I think that meeting the night before, when it's possible, and, you know, if I, if I fly somewhere for a mediation, I always try and meet the parties separately um, the night before. Yeah. So that's um, a question of timing, isn't it? It's a question of timing, but also um, it's logistics in that you, know, you, you can't identify one person to speak to uh, for the purposes. Yeah. Uh, when you've got a, a, a large team, there might be um, the chief executive officer, there might be the financial so officer, what, there might be others as well. To what extent in your preparation would you then seek to identify who the key players might be? And you know, I'm not waiting until the day itself, but in your inquiries, how do you do it, Elizabeth? How would you, what would you do? That's always a question that I ask the lawyer. Um, so when I have a telephone conversation with the lawyer, um, uh, the, the thing I want to know, uh, a lot of things I want to know from the lawyer, but particularly I want to know um, who are, who's likely to have the uh, exercise the authority at the end of the day. Uh, is it more than one person? Who is it? Uh, and I want to know. What are the personalities? Does the, has the lawyer worked with these people before? Does he know what their personalities are? Yeah. Um, how, what's their approach likely to be to the mediation? Um, and all of that I can get a sort of objective idea from the lawyer, as long as the lawyer's worked with these people before. 
Mike, 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 Mike you, we, we asked for Mike, Neville, good. Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, Jeff, why don't you speak one more? <laughs> well, I just, just to, to follow up what Elizabeth was saying, I often ask for the lawyers, who do I need to make a connection with? And it's interesting, it's, it's slightly different from who's the decision maker. But it's who's the sort of the soft authority in the room, and that's you often get a very surprising answer. It can often be not who you'd expect, yes. but, it's, um, it, but, but it, that's the person that I will make eye contact with when I, you know. Yes. Sorry. You know, there's, there's been a, um, I'd say, a problem with international arbitration. There's been a tendency um, for proceedings to always kind of follow the same rhythm and the same pace, and not be adaptable to the particularities of the disputes or the needs of the parties. Um, I think that's one thing, for example, the ICC recently passed a uh, new, new rules. They have this procedural conference. They sort of force the arbitrators to have this early conference and meeting. And you know, my experience is it helps a little bit to have that dialogue. I, I think you need to be careful with international mediation in you know, not falling into that same trap where everything gets done the same way. Um, there needs to be some type of dialogue, especially in international mediation, I would think, to understand how do you want to do this? I mean, and, and Stru focus structure. On the, yeah, I think you focus on the data. The problems I've had with some international mediations, and I think the ones that were not as, that was well done as they could have been, is that there was too much of an expectation that somehow the day was going to be it, rather than the settlement being the outcome that you wanted. And the earlier that you begin, I think, to kind of figure out how do we do this. Um, one, one experience I think that, that, that helped us immensely was we had Christian Gouve, who's a mediator in Frankfurt, um, he's a fantastic mediator in, in, in Europe, very contentious dispute between an, an, uh, an Irish company and an Italian company, so you know, cultural stereotypes, both sides rather emotional. Um, and the way that he, he, he scoped out the dispute with lots of conversations in advance was he decided to keep us in the room for the entire day, almost the entire day. So we're in a plenary session, and I don't think he would have done that had there not been a lot of pre-work done, reading about the case and talking to, to the sides. That's really helpful, and Mike, just while you're there with your experience, one of the points here is process design, and, and, and I think we put that up because we wanted to talk about the flexibility and to challenge perhaps the paradigm of the one day or the two day. Not to say that it isn't going to be the standard approach for all sorts of logistical, travel, and commercial reasons, but, but picking up on your point, do you think that there is scope for moving away from, or even a need to move away from that one or two day paradigm or are we talking about that remaining as a central uh, component, as it were, but in a continuum in which work has been done beforehand, however that is done, in order that that day or two works really well? Yeah, I think, I, I think that it is, there's, there's room to move away from this model of the wonder of the, of the day being where it all needs to take place. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, at the risk of falling into the old joke about there are two types of people in this world, those who believe that there are two types of people, you know, um, that there, I think there are two types of mediators. There are those who think that their job is to be there at the mediation and to facilitate, and there are others who think that their job is to help the parties reach a settlement, you know, however and whenever that happens. Yeah, of course. And and those mediators cross the boundaries of the day. They they just don't, you know, they don't really see the start time and they don't really see the end time. Yeah. That's really helpful. Jeff. Well, I, I think we, we on a slide coming up there's a sort of this is a process, not an event, which is exactly I think what Mike's saying. And and I think a, a lot of us doing this kind of work will spend more time in the pre-mediation stage on Skype, on GoToMeeting, having virtual face-to-face -face meetings before we land in the country to have meetings with, with the parties. And I think that's just our, our future, and it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Can I just touch on a few more points here, Jeff, because we've conscious of meetings yeah. to move on. Uh, I, I think the very point that you've made about process or event is, is what bullet point one is about. It's getting started with the first contact. For me, mediation starts with the first telephone call, and we're in mediation from that point all onwards, really. But, but, but John, uh, yeah. I think lawyers need to understand that well as well, right. that they need to start mediating <coughs> in the litigation. Once they decide to go to mediation, start you know, um, you know, getting your credits. Well, well, let's build on that, because next bullet point is communications and coaching. And I think this is about how we communicate as mediators, how we communicate with the lawyers, whoever they may be, how we communicate with the parties, if that's appropriate and, and uh, possible. The word coaching comes in because that, I, I think you and I have had this conversation. I'm a great believer in the mediator as coach, not as um, advisor, and certainly not as briefer of what to say, but I think there are 
there are themes and experiences we can draw on which allow us to guide the lawyers who might initially be resistant to be world-class performers to use that theme. And that takes me, Jeff, back into the summaries or position papers. In mean, my approach, um, I keep saying my approach, so let's an approach is to use the first contact and the first communication with the lawyers, the advisors, to help them to decide what to prepare. So I noticed, for example, if you receive your position paper and then we made contact with them. What I'm hinting at here, I think, is that in, in an initial contact, we can help them to populate the document and even, where possible, to do something jointly so they get into that collaborative mode. What do you think? Well, I've got to say, in my domestic work, position papers are, are certainly not the default. Right. So we, we are only discovering position papers um, as a useful tool domestically. So sometimes you'll just get a shoebox uh, full of papers and you know go find go find the issues. Jeff. So we're, we're I mean I think we're developing a, a default process, but we're not we're not there yet. Can we ask then again in the audience what what is your experience insofar as you have been involved in mediation and what is your perception even if not of what would be the most effective way for lawyers who are working in a collaborative process to help their clients to be world-class performers to maximize the outcome, what would be the most effective way to gather together the basic information, the key information that will help to move the thing forward? Is it a shoebox of paper? Is it a position paper? Is it a summary? Is it some joint work together? Is or any combination? Yeah. Tim. John. Um, I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, well, that's okay. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> um, I was waiting for the New Zealander because no, no, no. the New Zealanders um, the mistake they made if they didn't actually get off to Perth or Melbourne. They just kept floating on. Um, we're a little bit in a different uh, position because we've had mediation now for quite some years. Yeah. And we're now at the level of sophistication with the courts, where the courts actually make an order for mediation to take place, and actually as part of the order, direct that the plaintiff provide the plea to the mediator by a certain date. And there are quite specific directions provided in relation to the material. Um, the, I was interested in your comments, Jeff, about position papers, because where that certainly has been around for some time is in those matters that not, are not court annexed. And we've got quite a lot of those and have had for some years. And now, in recent times, we had legislation that imposed civil obligations upon parties and lawyers to try and resolve matters before instigation of proceedings. So increasingly, we're finding more and more mediation before um, issued. And Tim, what makes a good case summary or position paper? What, what do you, as a mediator, find you're looking for? Is it this case involves, you know, or is it is it something more than that? Well, one thing it's not is just regurgitating the pleas. Yeah. I, and I'll say that up front. I'm, I'm not interested to waste the client's money, quite frankly. It's one that just draws out the issues in salient point, almost bullet point. Some of them where you've got no proceedings on foot and they're quite complicated. Some of the best position papers I've seen are ones that actually go right into the detail. Uh, attachments, sometimes they can be experts' attachments. Uh, sometimes we can references to cases uh, as well. But I have to say nine times out of 10, um, a lot of the position papers that parties want to offer in the court connection, court and next matters, are, are really useful. Yeah. And there's, there's no reason. Mary? Hi, Mary Walker from Sydney. Um, I'm interested in the position papers that you talked about earlier. And, and I must say, I um, agree with the gentleman behind me that there, are, there is no formula. You really do need to work with all of them separately. But with lawyers, I find often, if we're not having a preliminary conference, because in Sydney, years ago, we were having preliminary conferences face to face with the parties and the lawyers. And because of the logistics and so forth, we've moved away from that to having preliminary conferences over the phone and then no preliminary conferences. Now it's moving back. I leave it to the parties and I say, look, there are at least 25% of the matters in your room, in your filing cabinets, which require the new conferences. And you've got to identify them and bring them. And I'm finding they are in the two preliminary conferences, but a lot of them, and particularly if they have an international flavour, are over the telephone. When I'm involved in those preliminary conferences, 
I often ask the lawyers different questions, and there's a presumption that they will look at documents which are, if it is a court order of mediation, ones which are familiar to lawyers through the court process. So I often ask them two other questions, and I say to them, what information do you feel that you need and that you need to provide to the other party to properly assess this matter for a negotiation? We know what's in the pleadings, we know what you're going to put in the position papers, but I need to draw you back. Now, I also need you to consider if there is an agreement at the end of the day, what it is that you see that agreement to be. I don't know that you need to know the answer to that, but I need you to consider that in whatever information you're going to provide and to talk to us about some of that information now. And I find that even, for example, in basic commercial matters where they're talking about um, perhaps repayment to banks or whatever it might be, and there might be property involved, nobody's bothered to get evaluation of the property and what might be useful for the day. So I think that there are a lot of ways around it, but I always don't, I, I certainly don't make a presumption about what the lawyers think that they will want because culturally, even between Melbourne and Sydney, we have differences, um, let alone if it's you know, somewhere in another country. I think what we're learning from this is that, again, no one size fits all. Flexibility and a lot of thought is required at the preparation stage. And I'm very conscious that as time moves on, we could spend the rest of this session just talking about preparation. That would not necessarily be time misspent. However, we can move on there, I think. What I wanted just to finish off with before we do that, though, is with one uh, tool that I have tended to use over the years which seems to be helpful. And it's a tool designed to get the parties thinking about what it's really about, if you like, what lies under the surface. And where, wherever I think it's appropriate, which is certainly not all the time, I will issue to the parties in advance the questionnaire which I'm just about to show you. And I'll ask them either to send it back to me because it will give me information, or to keep it and bring it to the mediation, or indeed perhaps to complete it at the beginning of the mediation, and then possibly to share the results with each other, all depending on circumstances. Questions like these. What do you really need to achieve out of this day? And if you achieved this, what would that mean for you? What do you need to do to achieve whatever it is? Or what do you need to say? What do you need to hear from the other party? I see this being photographed. We will make John, sure. these are oral questions or that? No, these are on a piece of paper. Oh, right. Questionnaire. What are your main concerns? What do you think the other party's main concerns may be? I'm sorry the setting of these has gone off and the transfer over to the PC. Where might misunderstandings have arisen? What do you think the other party really needs out of this? Now that's very much a getting into the other party's shoes preliminary idea or perception of what you think that they might be thinking. And all of these questions as well. Common ground, realistic options, if you're going to work together, what needs to be done? If you're not going to work together, madness of madness. If you can't find a mutually acceptable solution, what will be the consequences if it's not resolved? What do you think will be the consequences for them? Again, applying the madness of madness. Reflecting on these, and this question I'm not so sure about, what might be an outcome which you can live with, which you can live, I think that's actually premature yeah. at this stage. Um, I, I, and you know, therefore I will often say, answer the questions that are helpful amongst these questions. But just think about that, I, I don't want to set this up too highly, but that will often go out to the lawyers who will circulate it to their clients, who will discuss it with their clients, fill it in, send it back to me in advance, or and I've done this recently in a very complex, multi-party situation. Have the principals and the lawyers sit down in a room and go through each question sequentially, turn about, and tell each other what they've written. And also, a spin on this, what do you think the other guy wrote in his answer? And, before his, yeah. and John, they don't, I mean, these are sophisticated business people. Yeah. They don't feel this is a bit like a, being playing in a sandpit. I mean, they, they What don't, do you think? Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I might feel I was manipulated. Why? Well, just this, I, just the structure would yeah. worry me. I'd wonder what, you know, where this is going to, you know, as a party. Okay, Jeff, yeah. you're a party, all right? Yep. So I said, Jeff, you, you've kindly filled in this preparation I question. Have, with some reservations. Understand that and many people do. And it's designed to help me to help you to, to achieve that outcome. Yeah. What I'd like you to do is to come and sit with Joe in the other, from the other party, with me and your advisors, 
how we're going to go through these questions. Well, if I'd known that, John, I probably wouldn't have given some of those answers, <coughs> which are, to be fair, pretty honest. And when I sent it to you, I said it was confidential? Correct. So what I'm not going to ask you to do is to share with Joe anything with which you're uncomfortable. Right. However, I want you to think about well, it. Well, I tell you what, I would like to know some of Joe's answers to a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> so that, to that extent, I'm getting something for yeah. the troubles. Yeah. And what I think you might find is that Joe would quite like to know what you think about a couple of these also. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> and without, because without, I can't compel you to do anything in this mediation. No, no, and you're not. No. Without uh, doing that, I'm going to say to you, think about it. Think about it. Why is it that you would like to hear from Joe? What um, he's written to a couple of these questions. John, I'm not sure if this answers the question. Some of those I feel are really early. Some of those feel like four o'clock questions for me, and it's only 10 o'clock. So that's. Got you. And do you remember when we came in you said, I'm not staying till four o'clock, I'm not, it's all done. Yeah, that's all changed. It's all done. <laughs> <laughs> so all I would do, listen, I'm going to leave you with, with, with Bert, your, your, your lawyer, and yeah. think about this, and I want you to, to ask yourself, what do you think Joe might be helped by hearing from you? Yeah. All right, we may not be all these answers, but the idea is to give us a bit of structure, a bit of framework, to get you and Joe to think about things. Fair enough. All right. John, to what extent do you actually find you the actual client, sorry, to what extent do you find that the uh, user actually fills this out, and to what extent do you think the lawyers fill this out? But that's because okay. I, I have no feeling yeah. that you will find very sanitized versions of this coming back to you, having gone through the lawyers. Um, so, well, let's accept, let's even, accept. Even if it stays confidential, John? Even if it stays yeah. confidential, let's accept. it will be sanitized. Let's accept that that's, that's <coughs> even if that's the norm, yeah. It's better than nothing. Yeah. It's something to work with. Um, I would hope, and certainly in my experience, is that some lawyers will pass this to their clients and will work with their clients to possibly. It depends upon the sophistication of the lawyers and their understanding and commit, or understanding of and commitment to the mediation process. And we're talking about you know, international commercial mediation, something which is in the foothill, virgin territory, and trying to help people to make better use of it. So we've been provocative, we're throwing these out. I don't use this all the time. No. Of course I don't. I'm not naive. <laughs> but if I get something from this, which I would not otherwise have got, it's a little pearl, John, which might allow me to ask a question that might make all the difference. Let's do it no higher than that. John, I, I was thinking something very similar there. I think these are all really good questions. I wouldn't give them notice of them because I think that once they insert the questionnaire and I agree the lawyers may interfere with the answers, um, then they, want, they know what the questions are. These are questions that I think you pose to the client in front of his lawyer, but you, you address the client to it and, and, the, and the lawyer is, 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 is cut out of the picture because some honest answers to these questions, three o'clock in the afternoon, you might get one at that stage. But to give them notice in advance when they've committed themselves to a, a litigious stance in one of these, these answers, you can never be able to use it. That would be my concern. Well, that, that's, and therefore, maybe you have to decide and be, or be discerning about when and how you use it. And I'm content on that basis. I know it works in advance, and for the same reasons that you have given, they may be more appropriately used orally later on. So we leave it really as a, 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 this is, this is choice, isn't it? This is a, a marketplace of ideas. We need to move on, Jeff. Sure. Can we move on to this? Yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about cooperation between lawyers, between advisors. I might, I might focus on lawyers, but I know that you want to talk about it, and, and, and Michelle Calpitas has views about this, cooperation between experts, uh, which is, is as, as important. Uh, you know, I, I, get, I get asked two questions from lawyers when I meet them in the street at, uh, before a mediation. You know, what should we be doing to prepare, and secondly, what should our posture be? And I think lawyers often are confused about that, especially litigation lawyers. I, I remember when I was still in practice and flitting between the court being an advocate at mediation and a mediator, and that was in the very early days, and, and I can remember it doing my head in. I could not seem to, to make, make the switch. So, so the lawyers often ask, you know, what should my posture be? I think some of them, some of them think it should be nicey nice, which I think is completely wrong. 
Others think they should be a sort of bodyguard and run interference between the client and me and the client and the opposite number. So I think it is a perplexing problem for lawyers who, you know, are not always in mediation, but are, you know, are experiencing the mediation room now more than the courtroom. So what are some of the antidotes to these concerns that you as a mediator can employ, deploy to help the lawyers? Well, I, I think um, transparency is a big one. Once, once the lawyers uh, know that you as a mediator don't have a hidden agenda, I think the trust develops. And certainly it's, I, I love working with lawyers who I've worked with before because there is, you know, there is a, a development of trust and cooperation and they understand that you know, you're safe with it, you can be trusted with information and you don't have a, a hidden agenda, you're not trying to get anywhere. And I think you know, that, that, that really means they become a strategic partner. And I think there's a lot of talk in mediation communities about you know, lawyers and mediation. And I, you know, some of our academics, you know, lawyers and mediation, the government is setting up in New Zealand mediation schemes where lawyers aren't allowed in. You know, lawyers for a mediator, a, a working job in mediator, you know, are absolutely essential. So if you've got a particularly difficult lawyer in a mediation or even before a mediation, uh, and you're having a conversation with that difficult lawyer, what are the kind of things that you would say to encourage him or her to become more, um, I suppose, cooperative, more amenable and effective in the, in the mediation process? Why don't I play that lawyer and you could be the mediator? Yes, sir. <laughs> you mind if I just throw you in like that, Jeff? No, that's fine. Improvise role play. I, I, this is just, no, I don't get it at all, Jeff. I mean, you know, all this nonsense about collaboration. Yeah, I mean, you asked me to prepare, you know, position paper on, and I'll set out what I think. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, I'm not asking you to <laughs> take a back seat. I'm not asking you to, you know, not advocate for your client. But I do think that, you know, it's it's more, it's more how you say something rather than what you say. So say what you like, but I think I think some of the wording you're using is just gonna poison the well that you're gonna to have to drink from. Yeah, but you know, mediation. Edmund Glasgow, for his client, used all sorts of inflammatory language. Yeah. So I thought he was abusive towards New Zealand and Scotland. <laughs> like, why, why should I not feel like to use the same language back to him? Well, I think you have a choice. I mean, take the high road uh, or not, but your choice. I, and you know, I, I would say, and I, this is easy for me to say, I know, but you know, eye on the prize. Where do you want to get to? And you know, work out how you're going to get there. If you want to respond in kind, a absolutely. I, there's, 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 I'm not sitting here saying don't, but I would. Part of my role is to coach, and part of the, the some of the wording that you're using is is getting some air time in, in, you know, in the other camp. No doubt about that. But, you know, I, I, I haven't done much of these before, and it feels as though I'm giving in to, to, to this guy. You know, the big, harsh English QC. Yeah. Well, look. Sorry, I just did chip off my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think, I mean, we, we could go on. Yeah, but, yeah absolutely. But, um, I, think, I think that the point, the point that I'd like to make is that, you know, lawyers who collaborate cooperate with the media, mediator and each other, you know, can really pull a mediation along. I think when you get two clients who are, are not working well together, that's one thing. Yeah. But when you get lawyers and the mediator who are not working well, that can sink. So you, you mentioned here um, fertile areas of cooperation, pre-mediation, position paper, at the table, let's leave drafting for just now. Yeah. Pick, you can just pick one of these, Jeff, and just expand upon how at one of these, or in one of these stages or bullets, a difference can be made. Well, I was asking Tim what makes a good position paper before. I, I, I think that a well-written position paper is a is a is a wonderful tool for a for a lawyer. My my own my own sense is that it should be short, you know, two to four pages. It should be you know, helicopter view, and it should I think, uh, and I'm not sure how this translates, but. I think it should address the peace and not the war. Yep. So it shouldn't 
you know, be all about this case involves, the issues are this. It should be, in some ways, it should be focused on the commercial imperatives trumping the legal rights. And I think that's hard to do as a litigation lawyer, but I think, you know, a client, you know, a business person absolutely can do that. And if they don't do it in the position paper, they'll certainly do it at, at, the, at the mediation. And I think that's the secret. The, the commercial yeah. can, can, can come forward and the legal... But I think that's a really important point. I might just open this up for a quick conversation. One of the, the greatest areas for learning for me, if that's the correct way of putting it in the last few years, having been a lawyer, I no longer call myself an ass, or I don't practice anymore, is the expansion of the matrix, if you like, problem solving from just legal rights and remedies and the yeah. facts, which are often all that appear in these position papers. Yeah. And, 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 and which happen. Yeah. To the multifaceted nature of commercial problem solving. Reputation, publicity, risk, management time, opportunity cost, actual cost, uh, litigation expenses and costs and, and, and so forth, right through to stress, morale, turnover of staff, uh, contracts lost and so forth and so on. And as we sit and chat here, it seems to me that these are all relevant matter for summaries, or if not summaries, certainly for full discussion on the day. And often, I suspect these come in at the side, and we've got yeah. marginalised. What do you think? Well, well, I think some of those uh, can be in the position paper. Some of them may well be sensitive and, of course. and either for the mediator's eyes only. I, I sometimes, not often, sometimes get two yeah. papers. One open paper that's exchanged, and the second paper is for me only, and it's what it's got what I've referred to as the mediator intel. Look, I'm, I'm we've had a difficult birth on this. Uh, you know, the, my opposite number is is, is 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 difficult. I'm being difficult. You know, the client is X or Y. Um, you know, and that's tremendously useful. If we're talking about position papers, can I? I got this a few years ago, and I kept a copy of it. This is a position paper that's headed up in bold type and capitals. Nothing else. It's headed up. The reasons why ACME's claims are rubbish. And that was the start of, of a position paper that effectively sunk the mediation before we even started. So they are important tools. I think lawyers can give wonderful, subtle signals through them uh, if they choose to. Yeah. I'm very conscious that we want to move on to a couple more topics and time is running on. Can I assume uh, you know, that because we started about 15 minutes later that we might just have a little bit more time after quarter to four? Five? Oh. Four minutes, four o'clock. Four o'clock, lovely, thank you so much for that. Okay, this is all about cooperation amongst advisors and experts. Um, and what we're, I think, focusing on is the enormous benefits that will come if we as mediators and service providers can encourage and help the advisors of the various parties to cooperate as much as possible. So let me just ask for one comment before we move to the next session on anything or section, anything that we've said, particularly any challenges to anything we've said. I'm going to leave that. Are you going to leave that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, John, I'll take issue with the first point of um, things. Um, ill feeling between clients will often influence counsel. Um, my experience, it's the other way around. <laughs> I'm no no offence yeah. here, yeah. else. <laughs> but it, it does. Um, and in fact, I like to link it with the cooperation at the table because, so that I'm not being embarrassed all the time, I will tell a story that's in favour of a silk that came from Sydney or mediation. And at the joint session, he conceded all the problems they had. He was for the plaintiff. Conceded the problems, the defendants were left with nothing to say. And as a consequence, the mediation settled very, very quickly. So he took the cooperative approach. But I have had nine times... In fact, my wife will tell you, when I prepare the night before, and I read the material, I'll invariably look for who's done the pleadings, who's signed off on the pleadings, and who's the solicitor, and I'll tell you how the mediation will run. So, not that you made any prejudgments. Not at all, John. Not <laughs> at all. <laughs> yes, well, the other way a, a, a lawyer can present you know, in addition to being a bodyguard, is a hired gun. And I think that first bullet point is referencing that. I, I often see a, a, a lawyer who, who 
who sees him or herself as a hired gun and absolutely reflects the client's posture to the other side. And, and, and I think good lawyers don't, that would be my first comment, but some lawyers uh, will just simply take that as almost a miracle. And I, it, 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 it's it true. makes it very difficult. Okay, let's, let's move yeah, on right. uh, in the interest of uh, expedition. Well, to the opening two hours, but I think that's a really interesting. Well, it's interesting. So what, what, what we're going to talk about here is whether or to what extent the media to meet with the parties primary and who that might be. We've talked a little bit about breakfast, <coughs> meeting with principals, we talked about earlier on, managing a presentation of information. This is, I think this is this intriguing part of this. To what extent we coach, given that the objective overall is to achieve understanding, build confidence in the process, and get the ball rolling. So, Jeff, thoughts about the first two hours? What are your first two hours in aviation? Uh, about what do you do? Well, I'm I'm trying to set a tone, yep. uh, and uh, I'm trying to what I what I in my own mind see as sort of depositing credits in the bank because I know I'm going to withdraw in the afternoon, and so I'm I'm like all of us I'm sure much more active in the morning than I am in the afternoon a lot of the time, but I'm you know it's a, it's a cliche but I'm I'm tr trying to build trust in whatever whatever way so I so if I was to observe mediation conducted by Jeff Sharp of the normal sort, what would be the structure that you would follow in that first two hours in terms of meetings with whoever you meet with? If we're talking about a one-day yeah, mediation, that. let's just assume that change, I'll meet with each group uh, or affinity group, depending on how many parties, I'll meet with them privately before we convene in joint. So the first thing will be to meet and greet and meet them privately uh, at a two-party mediation. That may take, you know, half an hour, maybe a bit less. Is that half an hour each? No, normally uh, normally I would try and keep it to a quarter of an hour each, but, you know, it's really just it's just to start that conversation. Mm -hmm. Then we would convene. And, uh, again, I'd be interested in, Michelle, you might have a comment about this in terms of the London practice, but I will normally be in joint session doing the heavy lifting until lunchtime from there on. So we might get into joint session, say around 10, and we'll stay there until lunchtime, and we'll break for a loose stop or lunch. Uh, and I find that, that that's the engine room of, of a mediation. And that's where the, med, you know, that's where all the hard credits go in, that we can withdraw Draw on later yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, let, let me just, we're all going to come and open yeah. up the floor. We might, my approach would be like you to start off with private meetings with the, the clients and actually arrange for them to come at staggered start times so that I can start, say, 20 minutes or half an hour with party A, 20 minutes, half an hour with party B, and 20 minutes, half an hour with party C. And if necessary, I will take the half an hour because this is important in terms of building engagement, finding out who's who and who the key players, decision makers are, what the dynamics are, and a little bit about the sense of what they're looking for. And John, I think those early private meetings allow the lawyers a role as well. Yeah, they're, they're often very generous with me in terms of, you know, saying, here's yeah. the, you know, have, have the direct conversation, but it allows them to start work as well. Well, they're, they're, they're part of the whole process. Yeah. Then what I would do is have this, and this is, this is, this is conventional, not always practice, I have this breakfast, or this gathering, breaking bread together. Uh, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I will then have my spiel, an example of which I gave and Nicola did for at the start. See, I find that breakfast intriguing. I, I just don't it's, wouldn't it's even for you. Who pays for it, John? Who pays for it? Who pays for it? Yeah. Parties are happy. It's not, it's not expensive. We have five spent the cost of the room. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about multi-million pound cases sometimes. Yeah. Even if it's ten thousand pounds, it tends to be a small part of the overall cost. Anyway, it's interesting though. There uh, might be a battleground over that. And yeah. I, I find now that I am accustomed to doing so often. And this is more, I suppose, domestically, but I also have done it internationally. That people just take it as as, as well. Anyway, be that as it may, and then. I would, wherever possible, meet with the principals, having set that up in the initial meeting. I would then possibly also meet separately with the lawyers to touch base with them and to manage the process of what I call a management meeting. And then my plenary session, I very rarely now have the classic of one side sending out the position and the other side sending out the position. I just think that can tend to be negative, uh, regressive, and unnecessary if, if the papers that have been prepared in advance are, are well done. I will tend to have one party. Let's. Usually the claiming party, in the broadest sense, 
set out their stall in the way that they want to. And it usually would be the client, perhaps with the lawyer and even the expert supplementing, depends upon the circumstances, and then I'll adjourn after perhaps a few questions from the other party. And I'll say to the other party, this is all set up. So it'll give you time to go away and think about what you've heard, distill it, digest it, and think about what you're going to say. Not in a tit-for-tat response, but what you want to say to build on this. And a half an hour or 45 minutes might pass, and then they come in and they set things out. And that is a twofold advantage of making it seem as though they have listened to and are responding to what has been said by the notional claiming party. And secondly, it's a much more creative and constructive approach because it cuts out this kind of yahoo, yes, no, right, wrong approach. And by, by 11.30 or so, there's some really rich material out on the table with all sorts of possibilities there for, for further sessions. So it's just a different way of doing it, Jeff. Uh, but it, what I'm very keen to do is to break the mold of the uh, traditional fixed approach to yeah. plenary sessions. Yeah. Can, can we take, yeah. a, take a bit of a, a, a poll? Do people, do people you know, still see the value in joint sessions? Because I know the Americans uh, are, you know, California anyway, is a corpus only model, which I find, uh, you know, I'll retire if that if it comes my way. But um, what do people think about joint sessions? Are they dangerous? As lawyers, are they dangerous? Are they bear pits? Are they unscripted? Ian, hang it. I tend to go along with what, what you were saying before. So I think the longer you keep people in a joint session, the more the more chance you have of success. I absolutely agree. Together. Yeah. And the reason being that, uh, and the lawyers are always wanting to stop the joint session, you know, heard what you got to say, let's, let's go out and do a deal. Uh, and what you learn in private session, you say, well, that's terribly important. Why didn't you say it in there? Yeah. Yeah. And the mediator, if he starts carrying messages, is going to rep misrepresent things by accident. So I think the longer you stay in that session, the better. Michelle? Michelle? I agree with you. I agree with you. The, the longer the open session can last, the better. Um, I do a lot of training for lawyers as advocates in mediation. And lawyers who tell me they don't want an open session are missing an enormous opportunity. Because as I point out to them, it's the only time that a lawyer is allowed to speak directly to the other side's client. And my great philosophy is that if you manage the open session properly, a clever lawyer who's prepared properly and knows what mediation is about. He sets the agenda for the discussion in the other side's room once we go into caucus. And that's the secret. I mean, I go after an open session, go into the room, and they're not talking about their own case, they're talking about the other side's case. To my mind, that is a successful open session by the other side lawyer. And I think lawyers too often don't realize the benefits of really preparing well for mediation. And, and I agree with you, it's not a sort of yahoo and this is my case, that's your case. Yeah. It's yeah. just making concessions and setting the agenda for the discussion for the rest of the and, day. And Michelle, it's wonderful to watch a skillful lawyer in a joint session making a connection with the client on the other side. Yep. And that's a frightening prospect for the lawyer on the other side, that exactly. suddenly there is some spark between the lawyer and the client, uh, the, the opposite client. And that's uh, wonderful. Uh, before going to the gentleman behind, yeah. Michelle, to what extent would you consciously coach the lawyer and perhaps the client, not again of what to say, but how to go about it so that they do make more effective use? You know, how are we cut and dice the plenary session? We're, both, we're all saying the same thing. It's how you make the best, best use of it. Well, as Jeff does, I see each side beforehand. Usually, it depends on the case, it depends on the clients, it depends on what I know the lawyers or, or the clients. You know, I, I make sure that session is a thorough session. And that's where I tease out what they really want to say to the other side. Now, often I'm asked, well, Michelle, what's your view? Do you think if we said this would be a good idea or a bad idea? Well, again, depending on the circumstances, I would answer the question the best way I can. So it's not actually coaching, mm -hmm. but people forget that um, the best lawyers and speak to the mediator before they even get to the mediation day. And I try and persuade lawyers to find out three things from their clients. First, it's rather like your list, but I don't hand the, the list out, but what, what their client actually must have out of a settlement, what they can't possibly have out of a settlement, and what they would like to have out of a settlement. Now, if each side does that, and then they tell me, I'm able to help them much better to, to make the open session more productive 
and as I say, set the agenda for the other side's discussion once we go into caucus. Excellent. Can I ask you to pass the microphone to the gentleman just behind? I think George. I think George. Uh, George. Yeah. yeah, in my view, the uh, <laughs> joint session is extremely important for three other reasons. One is that, uh, firstly, it allows the parties to vent their feelings. Because that's just an important part of mediation as resolving the case. Without a joint session, they can't properly vent. Uh, the second reason is that uh, it allows both parties to hear each other's cases, things that perhaps they were not advised by their lawyers. And the third reason is that it allows them to uh, break the ice. Even if they don't like what they're hearing, that itself is a form of communication. Without that, if it's too sanitized, it's, uh, it's harder to reach a resolution. I, I, something occurred to me that I may have given the wrong impression. All I'm, all I'm suggesting is, is, is the possibility of breaking up the joint session and having a, a bit of an intermission, if you like, between the two and, and, and enhancing it. But then, of course, that's a matter of choice and circumstance as well. George. Yeah. I did. Can I just say to you yeah. folks that George may or may not say this, but George and I trained as mediators in Edinburgh together in 1996. In extraordinary. <laughs> and we're meeting again for the first time after 18 years. Uh, and George hasn't changed a bit. He's not, in fact, he looks younger now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you notice the lack of wisdom. You were married then. <laughs> Where's your honor? <laughs> yeah, you didn't tell me you were married then. <laughs> OK, I, I found it um, increasingly important to hear the parties. Uh, I know we say that theoretically, but um, I did a medical neg negligence case on Monday. Um, and it was just the, the patient explaining what he went through, and the doctor hearing that. And not only that, his wife was with him, and his wife explained what she went through as well. And that was so powerful and so important. Um, it came out raw. You know, it was not structured, but for me, it's imp I tell them it's important for you to say what's in your heart. Because we find it increasingly so that parties don't talk to each other for two years, they talk to the lawyers, and this is the first opportunity that they have where they hear each other and they begin that communication. So for me, from the last 10, 20 mediations, I find this important to let the parties speak right at the beginning. Yeah, great. Good stuff, thank you very much indeed. Elizabeth? I was just going to say, um, I'm not sure about, ju just from my, I, I think this is a matter of personal style, and it's also a question of um, uh, uh, the parties and the personalities you have there. Um, there are times when uh, it seems appropriate to break um, uh, a uh, joint session, let the parties take a breather and come back again. Um, but equally, um, uh, for me, when personalities are right, uh, the flow of a joint session can be absolutely magic. Mm, absolutely. And uh, indeed, I mean, there are occasions where it, uh, seldom I agree, but there are occasions when you can even settle a case in a joint session because if it's going well and the magic is there, you know, the, the flow um, uh, goes, you clear a lot of misunderstandings, parties start to make connections, um, uh, uh, s s uh, drop the suspicions that they've had with the other parties. and. I would be, um, if, if that's flowing well, I would be very reluctant to, to break that. And that's my ideal joint session. It, I don't always get it, but my ideal joint session is one which really flows. Yeah. Yeah. And Elizabeth, if the joint session all goes wrong, uh, strategies, you just break? And yeah, yes. I mean, or, let, or let it go wrong and then let it build? Well, uh, uh, of course, as a mediator, you don't always have complete control of that. I mean, I'm on my metal in joint session to say to myself at every moment, um, is this a moment when I should be breaking this? Uh, but of course, sometimes you miss that moment, and, uh, and it has all fallen on the ground, and then you have to build it back up. Um, so you have to work with what you've got. Yeah. Um, but more often than not, it seems to me that um, given reasonable personalities, um, an enormous amount can be achieved by the good flow of a joint session. And what's interesting, I think, about all of this is, as ever, that, as you say yourself, much of this is down to individual style. Um, nothing is fixed. 
what we've watched today is to throw out some ideas, sometimes provocatively, and appreciate the richness of the diversity of approaches and, of course, the reality that in most situations, circumstances will be variable, and therefore we have to adapt. And that's the great joy of this discussion. And, Jeff. and John, even in coaching is controversial in some jurisdictions. I mean, I, I have a lot of discussions with lawyers about coaching. They say, you do what? And, you know, some people don't see that as the legitimate role of a mediator, whereas I think as we get on in this profession, in this field, it's becoming more of a role than ever before. And it depends what we mean by coaching. Yeah. And as Michelle was saying, how are we doing? Yeah. Let's finish off, uh, Jeff, with this whole thing is about sticking at it, even to the point where all seems lost, that extra bit, the extra margin can make all the difference. So I'm going to ask you just to pick a couple of points from here, and, yes. and we could need to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Uh, well, I mentioned inoculation there, and that's my yeah. sort of current uh, buzzword. I, I, I think inoculating uh, is a wonderful tool to, to prep lawyers, to prep parties for the long haul. And so often I do mention to parties, look, there's going to be a three o'clock, you know, um, it's darkest before the dawn, all that kind of stuff. Just be prepared for it. Stick with me, and I often put it on me purpose, hang in there with me. We will get through this, even if you don't think it's going anywhere, you know, 80 20, all that kind of stuff. And so I think. 80 20, what does that mean, Jeff? You keep saying 80 20, we're going to get there. I mean, look, it's, it's 4 o'clock. I know, and, and look, John, all I can say is we've done our 80, and we're about to get to the 20. Can you guarantee that? Yeah, and it'll happen quite fast. So I need you to just hang on there with your fingertips, and you might have to make some decisions under some pressure, but that's what you've come for. And you've done all the good work. You know, you've. We, we, we have a number, of, a number of agreements in terms of what happened, why it happened. We think we know where this should end up, just in terms of conceptually. So here we come. As my friend Jeff Privis in California says, buckle up, we're coming into land. And with that, <laughs> <laughs> the, the key thing is, is to stick it. I don't know about you, but I can't think of a number of mediations in which it, 6.15, or actually 4.29 is the usual time, it all gets really tough. Yeah. You know, people say this is not going to work, and you might think to yourself, gosh, I have no idea how this is going to work. But sticking at it, working at it, yeah. and, and keeping, the, you know, keeping the pressure on it, Jeff, as opposed to you just did with me there, but most people want to resolve, don't they? Well, I, I think it is legitimate for mediators to push and prod <coughs> to an extent. Yeah. But I, I think it's very dangerous, and we all know the feeling that, you know, where we, we're the only sponsor for resolution in the room, everybody else is disengaged. I think it's a very dangerous place for a mediator to be, to be the only one leading the charge at four o'clock in the afternoon. And unless you've got people with you, hang in there with you, who are saying, yep, I can see us doing this, then I think it's a very dangerous place. So the key then is not to be in that dangerous place, Correct. and to <coughs> draw it away, which is the whole point of the exercise today, is to think about the means by which from the get-go, from the first call, we engage people sufficiently, whoever they are, whatever role they have, so that when push comes to shove at 4 o'clock, 4.29 or 6.15, they're with us. Now, I think our parties are getting fidgety. They are. So we should uh, go into private session. I think we should. Now, we did have another spike here. We did. And one question was, do you do all your follow-up within the same price, Jeff? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I have, a, I, I have a very simple pricing structure. I've charged a, a fee for everything, no matter how far I fly, no matter how long I, I go on the day or the... This is not a marketing opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, so you include everything. Could, but something that doesn't work. And so you, you would follow up, follow Absolutely. through. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if they sort of meet again. Yeah. Yeah. I think the key thing here is the follow through and the follow up. I think most mediators here will do this because they don't all resolve or settle on the day. And the question is what can you continue to do as mediators interested in the parties and their futures and resolution which keeps them on side and gives them the best chance of finding that seven at some point. And look, I don't think they want you to give up. If they do, they'll tell you to, you know, clear off. Yeah. But until they do, I'm I'm ringing them every week, two weeks, whatever, whatever makes sense. Last bullet point here is end well, and there are lots of things one could say. I remember one mediation where we thought we got to the deal, and somebody said, "Let's get some wine in." <laughs> and I was still quite a naive, inexperienced mediation mediator, so I went down to the local wine shop. Got a bottle of red and a bottle of white. Brought it back in. This was about 7.15. And it all required was for the lawyers to work out the draft of the settlement agreement. It was a complicated IP matter. At 
the wine was all consumed. The only people who had consumed it were the lawyers. <laughs> they were incapable of typing or writing the words, far less formulating the agreement. So we had to adjourn and meet again for another day, because of course the whole thing I unwound in the meantime, to never have booze <coughs> have to be sure it's signed and sealed. And it's really important to find people. So before we finally conclude, can I just say first of all thank you to all of you for your engagement, acknowledge your listening and involvement, say how much we appreciate it, and invite you to think about this, to what extent should mediators be helping folks to learn from the instant matter, the instant case, for the future. Because, as Confucius said, he who learns but does not think is lost. He who thinks but does not learn is in great danger. <laughs> so for you folks, without spending time on this, what we invite you to do at some quiet moment today or tomorrow is ask yourself, from all that we've discussed in the last hour and 20, what will make a difference? What one thing would you do differently tomorrow and why? How can you make better use of mediation, perhaps in the light of what we've said, and write down three points? Because that's always the way to take away, think and learn from a session. In the meantime, we're going to say, Jeff, thank you all very much indeed.